Okay, today we're going to take a look at another problem and see how we can compare models against each other, right? Uh, I posted the file on Scholar, which is called Chorn. So go ahead and download the file Chorn, all right? And I will find the file on my drive right there, chorn.jump. Okay, so the file <coughs> deals with uh, cell phone customers. I don't remember if we discussed that or not, but uh, subject of data analytics, uh, you can kind of think of that as uh, it was born between two industries, really, telecom and finance, okay? You know, if I told you the story about Capital One, everybody knows what Capital One is, right? It's a major credit card company. Well, uh, the story behind Capital One is this. Um, Back then in the days, 20, 30 years ago, uh, how did the banks or credit card company issuers decide uh, what should be the limit on each credit card and what should be the interest rate on each credit card? Well, probably if the customer has high risk of default, right, not paying uh, the balance on time, then uh, what do you want to do with the, with the interest rate? if he's a credit risk. Increase it, right? High risk, there should be a high return. And what do you want to do with the uh, credit limit? Probably decrease it, right? So don't give them that much money and charge a lot of interest for that, right? Uh, but companies really didn't know what to do, like how even to judge, you know, how much credit risk is each person individually based on their uh, credit ratings and profile and demographics and education background and income and all that, right? So, a small bank in Virginia, I believe it, it, it was called Signet Bank, a um, couple of people came to the board of directors and said, well, you know what, we don't have data right now because all you did was really offering, the, you know, offer the same uh, conditions to everybody. So, there was no differentiation between the customers. Some of them became bad, high risks, some good risks. So let's do this. Uh, let's start randomly offering different terms and conditions to everybody, different interest rate, different uh, balance. And uh, originally, of course, what we will see is increase in defaults because you know randomly you give more money to a high risk customer than you know you have a default, right? So there would be a higher cost of operations for a year or two, but we will accumulate some data, okay, on who got what conditions in terms of credit uh, credit card, right, terms and conditions. And uh, we will know pretty much everything else about the customer, their age, you know, education level, income, credit score, where they live, what their job title is, et cetera, et cetera. And then we can run the model that will tell us, hey, this is a bad credit risk, and this is a good credit risk. And then we can uh, approach that more uh, intelligently. So they did. I believe they saw initial increase in the uh, default rates because they started to offer different uh, conditions for your each customer. But uh, in a couple of years, they started to run the model, and they were essentially pioneer of this of this whole approach. And they saw that uh, the business picked up so uh, <coughs> significantly that the bank decided to spin off the company, make it you know a separate credit card company, and that's what we currently know as Capital One. Okay. So uh, another story is this one, churn. Churn of customers, what does it mean, churn? Turnover. Turnover, right? Turnover of customers. I don't know if we discussed that or not in this class, but cell phone companies reach saturation. The market is saturated. I have a cell phone, am I going to buy another one? No, right? All I need is just one. So when all customers have a cell phone, you can't sell more cell phones or more plans, right? If you're a carrier, a provider, so the only thing that you can do is steal customers from other competitors, right? And that's what happens right now. There is a uh, big four, right? Have you noticed that uh, a lot of industries operate like that, big four, right? So accounting companies, for example, there are big four companies, right? There is PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, KPMG, Ernst & Young, and Deloitte & Touche, right? Then cell phone companies are big four, right? There is Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, right? Um, big oil companies, there is ExxonMobil, there is Shell, British Petroleum, right? So 
some big names. A lot of industries operate like that. Okay, anyhow, uh, churn basically is, uh, the idea is every once in a while when your contract expires, right, in the United States we're mostly on the contract basis with companies, with cell phone carriers, right, when your contract expires, there is a good chance that you will uh, move to a different carrier, right? Uh, cell phone co uh, companies know that, so therefore <coughs> their interest would be to keep on to the customers that they have and possibly steal others, right, from, from their competitors. So uh, predicting which customer will, uh, bless you, which customer will go away, switch, and which customer will stay is important for them. So therefore, here is the file, okay? Uh, first column, churn, well, uh, it, it has 3,300 observations, right? First column, churn, true or false, that tells us if the customer switched, and it, it's true, or is uh, he, he or she stayed, right? That's false. Okay, and then there is state, where the customer is located. Account length, uh, I'm guessing that would be months. How many months a person stayed with the cell phone company, right? Whether or not they have international call plan, um, VM stands for what? VM plan. <laughs> Voice messages probably, right? Voice messages. Um, then N, V, mail messages. N stands for number, right? Number of voicemail messages. Whatever, whatever they're using for, to measure, right? Then uh, how many minutes they use during the day? Uh, how many calls do they place during the day? It depends on how you define day, right? What's a day? You can kind of informally split it between morning, day, evening, night, and then something else, right? So uh, they have evening minutes and evening calls and evening charges, day charge. I quite honestly don't know what day charge, night charge means. So uh, information about calls during the day, during the evening, during the night, and international calls, right? Minutes, number of calls, and how much money do they charge for them? Right? And another one is number of customer service calls. Can that be a predictor whether or not the customer will switch? Number of calls that they place to the customer service. Can be, right? Uh, it can be as simple as, hey, you know, I recently looked at my bill and there is something weird going on. Or uh, my cell phone has no reception, right? Either way, if customer calls the uh, service center, that's rarely to praise them for the great service, right? Hey, I just want to tell you, you know, you, you're doing a good job, keep doing a good job, okay? So I'm with you people. No, probably to complain about something. So that can be a predictor, right? Okay, anyhow, uh, let's take a look at what can we do with this file. So do we have the, uh, hold on, uh, tool matrix, right? So. Uh, since we want to predict who will stay and who will leave, right, churn of the customers, it's a supervised learning, right? And our response target variable is categorical, true, false, right? So therefore, our choices really are between classification tree, logistic regression, or neural network, right? So let's, let's try all of them, pretty much. Okay, so I'm going to switch to the file. So let's do the classification tree first. And uh, also, we already have the validation column built in, right? So we already split the data between the uh, training set, validation set. So that's good. All right, so uh, how do we build classification tree? It's easy, right? You go to analyze, predictive modeling, and then you do the partition, right? So it's kind of a little bit of training before the final exam, right? Sort of. So we already finished the material, the main course of the material, and now we're just looking at applications. Okay, so partition. Um, my target response is churn right there, and I'm going to pick everything, all of them except validation, right, as my X factor predictors, right? And validation, I'm going to place in the validation column. Just like that. Okay. And then I click OK button. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, there it says my initial screen uh, basically says what? Let's uh, go into the right triangle in the display options. Let's ask for counts and probabilities and all of that, right? So, out of my 
out of my, uh, it's not actually 13, uh, 3,300 observations, right? Because what I'm looking at really right now is just a testing set, right? So 2,221 observation, okay? That's my uh, training set, not testing, training set. Uh, so what do I see? About 14%, 14 and a half to be precise, right? Percent of customers in my training set decided to uh, switch to the competitor, right? Now that's my churn rate, essentially, okay? That's pretty substantial, about 15%, right? It's about what? Once each customer, one customer in seven, right? One out of seven switch the carrier when their contract expires. Approximately, that's what it means, right? That's pretty significant, right? Pretty substantial. So if I can find who this customer, and what can I do, by the way? Let's say I run the model that tells me, yeah, you can predict who will stay and who will switch, more importantly. What's the next step? Michael? Why they're switching, and after that? Action, right? So uh, if you attended yesterday's presentation, remember that Dave uh, was telling that this part is easy, right? Uh, anybody remembers uh, any numbers that he was given? Uh, he was giving like uh, building the model, tweaking things around and seeing which variable is important, which variable is not, takes about uh, what percentage of time for the data analytics people? Remember what he was saying? It's about, yeah, about 5 to 10% of the time, right? So that part is easy. Building the model and getting the result out of that is uh, practically very quick, right? The rest of the time, remember what he said, what takes 80 to 90% of the time? You have to like, present the data to like, the decision makers. So they can Presentation is one of them, right? But the preparatory stage, right, that comes before that. Data is never clean. So in this class, uh, I give you data sets, and they're all nice, right? You don't have any data that's missing, right? You don't have to pull data from multiple sources. In actuality, it's not like that. In fact, uh, when Dave was talking about uh, how he gets the data, probably the uh, medical field is the one where you uh, pull, it's very hard to pull the data to get. That's probably part of the reason why medical research is not moving very fast. So one reason for that is, uh, he mentioned actually that yesterday, all data in medical field is scattered across multiple different programs. There are more than one standard how to store the data, right? More, like there are multiple commercial companies that provide software. So if you go to, I you know, Centera, they'll create a record for you, right? And they'll give you record ID. Uh, if you go to Riverside, to see general physician or whatever, right? They'll create a record for you and they'll give you a different ID. And it cannot be the same thing. Uh, it will not be the same thing. It, uh, the, the, only, uh, the only way how it can be the same thing if, uh, uh, is, is when they use your social security number, right? If they use your SSN as the patient ID, then it's going to be the same in both systems. But the thing is, it's illegal to use social security number for medical records, okay? So they have to assign you a separate ID. So therefore, the data is separated on multiple platforms uh, and they, they're not exactly compatible with each other, right? Anyhow, let's, uh, let's go back to this one, right? So we click on the go button and it splits. And look at that, it stops uh, at how many splits? Looks like 19, right? So 19 splits, you can see that the uh, blue line keeps going, right? And that's R squared. R squared has the goodness of measure, right? Uh, good, the goodness of fit measure, okay? We discussed that. Uh, training set, if you keep splitting, you're, uh, you're getting closer and closer and closer to the data, right? Your leaves, the final leaves where you make a determination, is that a customer who is going to leave or who is going to stay? Right? The more you split, the closer you are, the purer the, your, your uh, final leaves becoming, right? That's on training set. It's always the case. But what happens is you're starting to overfit the noise, right? Uh, like specific things that are just random in your training set. And therefore, when you use completely different sets, such as validation, you can see it right here, your R square stops improving, really. In fact, it starts going down, right? Because you're just following your training data too closely, right? 
you're overfitting and you're picking on the noise, right? So therefore, it stops splitting right here at 19 splits because after that, it's all going down. Okay, so uh, here is my model, essentially, right? And uh, let's see um, column contributions. Just out of curiosity, right? Which variables contribute the most for the decision to leave, right? So uh, my uh, classification tree says that number of minutes used during the day is primarily reason number one, right? Number of customer service calls, we kind of predicted that one, right? We said that the more customer calls, service calls the person is placing, uh, probably it's not happy calls, right? So therefore it's a good predictor if the person is going to leave in the future, right? Then international plan, whether or not they have it, international calls, right? Then we have international minutes. So things are international that are important, right? Uh, evening minutes, evening charges, voice uh, messages, number of messages, and if they have the plan or not. And night minutes, apparently, but after that, it kind of drops out, right? So all of other stuff is not, not that important. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, remember how in the previous class we discussed how you can compare models when you have uh, like linear regression going on, you have regression tree going on, and you have neural network going on to predict numerical target. You can go ahead and save the probability formula, right? We did that in the previous class. And after that, uh, <coughs> use something that's called uh, model comparison, right? So that it brings all models together and says, hey, for each model, let's list R squared, let's list, uh, it's called race, right? Uh, root average square error, right? So all typical suspects, typical measures of how well your um, your model fits the data, okay? Something like that can be done also with models just like this one where we predict categorical response. So let's do this. Go to the uh, red triangle thingy, right? And uh, we're, we want to look out for something that's called publish model or publish, <laughs> yeah, publish prediction formula right there. So under save columns menu, uh, you can see Publish Prediction Formula. So when I click on Publish Prediction Formula, what it opens up is something, it's a, another kind of built-in tool into Jump. It's called Formula Depot, okay? Uh, so essentially, it's, it's kind of a script that we run separately, okay? So this model that I just built, it was saved into the Formula Depot, okay? So uh, I'm going to build a couple of models, and then from the Formula Depot, I'm going to run the model comparison. And it will do exactly the same thing for me. It will say, uh, how do they compare against each other? It will probably give me R squared measure. Uh, what else? What, what's the most popular measure? How nicely your model fits the data for classification problems? Misclassification rate. Misclassification rate, right? So that's our primary suspect. So I'm not going to close this window. I'm just going to put it down. <laughs> so that's it. I'm done with... Um, building the tree, so let me go ahead and close out this one. Uh, let's do alternative model, right? That would be logistic regression, right? <laughs> we just did the tree, let's do the logistic regression. So I'm gonna fit the model and say, yep, let's use churn again as my target variable, right? <laughs> and I'll use everything else as my predictor so, except validation, of course, right? Validation is not a predictor. So I add that to the model's effect. And then validation goes into the field that says validation, not surprisingly. Now, I'm predicting who will leave, right? That's primarily my target audience. I want to identify people who will go away when their contract expires. So therefore, my target is going to be true, right? Churn equals true. People who are leaving for the competitor. And then I click the run button, and there it is. Okay, here is my uh, output. So, uh, now, you probably remember that uh, when we're dealing with logistic regression, we're running the same set of tests, right? So, unlike the tree, in the tree we can't really say which variable is significant and which is not. We can look at column contributions, right? And if the column contribution is high, that's important variable. That's where it first splits the tree, right? If the contribution uh, of the column is low, that's not so important. But there are no p-values. We don't test hypotheses. We don't have anything quite like that. Right? We just look at the variables and kind of sort them from most important to the least important. But that's it. We don't do any hypothesis testing. Here we actually do. 
hypothesis testing with logistic regression, right? So uh, how do I eliminate the variables? The ones that have to go have the p-value high, right? More than 0 0.05. So if p-value is high, I keep the null, and null says that the slope can be set to zero, thereby taking the variable out of the equation completely. So it looks like uh, account length can go, and I can actually eliminate variables right now, right? So just click on the variable and say remove. So how long the customer stayed with us, apparently, and that was not the case, by the way, also in the previous model, agree? Okay? When we uh, construct the tree, the classification tree, the account length was not important, right? So there is no such thing as, what's it called? Customer loyalty, right? <laughs> there is such thing in marketing as customer loyalty, right? Uh, like uh, Apple, one of the examples, right? People who buy Apple, they really like Apple and they're crazy about Apple, they buy Apple computers, right? For no good reason, quite honestly, just between us chickens, right? Because Apple is one of the worst investments that you can, that you can make, right? That's just my personal opinion, right? How many of you have Apple computers? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, but uh, there is such thing as customer loyalty. In fact, I read somewhere there was a, an article, I believe, in uh, CNN Financial News. People who work in Apple stores, they're probably, uh, that's, that's where the most injustice is being made. Because the hourly rate is really, really low. They're, they're sales personnel, but they don't leave because that's basically their, their fan base, okay? They're crazy about Apple products. They're so sleek. They like them. They like using them. So they like to be involved with Apple, even if, if that job doesn't pay a lot. Okay, so that's your customer loyalty right there. So this model basically tells us that there is no customer loyalty, right? How long you stayed with the carrier doesn't really do anything for the likelihood to leave or stay. So I'll go ahead and eliminate uh, uh, next one. Uh, what do we taking? What are we taking out? Evening calls, right? Then evening charges, whatever that might mean. Daily calls, we eliminate. By the way, daily calls, I believe, they were important in our tree, right? If I remember correctly, yeah. So logistic regression tells you, nah, -uh, not important really. Okay, uh, international charges. That's also kind of amazing because I believe international stuff was all important, right? Uh, daily minutes have to go, day, no. Now I have to take away night calls. Night minutes, right? Now I'm getting close, actually. So this one is 0 0.07, still has to go. State is not important, right? Doesn't really matter where the customer is from, which state. And uh, that's it, right? I don't have anything else which is worth taking out, okay? How is this procedure, by the way, called? When I throw all the variables against the wall and kind of take out one by one until I, uh, I have only one, uh, ones that are important. Uh-huh. Stepwise backwards elimination, right? Because this procedure can be actually reversed. So I can add variables one by one, right? Uh, or I can remove them one by one. So this one is backwards stepwise uh, elimination regression procedure, okay? So this is the stuff that I have left in my model, and these are the only variables that are important, right? Okay, so I'll do the same exact thing. I'll publish the formula, and hopefully it will go into the formula depot, okay? Well, let's see if I can find that thing. Save script. No. Oh, here it is, right? Publish probability formula. It's not in the save menu. It's kind of a little bit weird, right? Sometimes they go into the save uh, column. Sometimes it's just right there. Uh-huh, Michael? Like last class, you did, like, save probability formula for the continuous one. Is this the exact same thing as that? Like, with the publisher, is it different? It's different. Save... Save probability formula, it goes straight into your data file. Yeah. Publish, it goes into the formula depot. So do we need to remember to publish like, a like a categorical one versus like a continuous one? Yeah, yeah. So when, you, when you're saving, you're dealing with continuous responses, right? Then you, you do the save. So all the saves, they go into the, uh, so here, right? They go straight into the, into this file right there, okay? Uh, when you're dealing with, uh, where was that? Yeah, with publish, it goes into the formula depot. So you will see. Right now, for example, my formula depot, let me open the window. Where is that? Right there, report formula depot, right? It contains only partition. So my tree that I built in the previous step, right? Okay, and now when I'm going to publish my probability formulas, 
that's supposed to update my formula depot. So let's go to formula depot, and there it is, right? So I have nominal logistics as well, okay? So save goes into the file, publish goes into the formula depot, right? Okay, uh, so that's cool. Uh, and now let me go ahead and close out this thing. Now let's build the third one, right? And the third one is going to be which one? Which also can we use to predict our categorical true-false response? The universal applied to all kinds of situations. Neural net, right? Neural network. You can predict anything with neural net. So powerful. Okay, so I go to analyze predictive modeling and neural, right? And churn is my target. All the other variables are my X factors, right? X factor sounds cool, right? Uh, is there a TV show X factor? <laughs> it is, right? Yeah, validation goes to validation, and then I click OK, and uh, neural net always requires the validation, right? Neural net actually is amazing. The more data you throw at the neural net, the better it becomes. So the more accurate the learning is, and the more uh, closely the model follows the actual data, okay? Because it has so many parameters, you can tweak them around uh, and uh, and really make the, the model uh, almost exact, almost precise, okay? All right, uh, so which activation function do you think I should use? I have choices, three choices, right? Tan H, hyperbolic tangent, uh, linear function, and Gaussian, so basically a bell curve. I'm predicting who will stay and who will leave. What's the best candidate? Should it be linear? No. Linear is not a good choice, right? Linear will predict all kinds of stuff for you, right? I want to only 0, 1, right? True, false. 10H, 10 10 right? 10H, which is a sigmoid function, right? It has very limited, uh, what's it called? Uh, there is function domain. Domain is from minus infinity to, pl to plus infinity, right? And then there is range, right? Range is what values the function takes, right? Takes the values from minus 1 to plus 1, okay? So that's the one that we want to use, right? And let's actually be creative, all right? Instead of just three, uh, I don't want you to have an impression that all the artificial networks have one hidden layer with three nodes in them, right? Let's make something bigger. How about that? I'm going to make four nodes, okay, in the first layer and eight nodes in the second layer, right? And second layer is closer to the input, right? Uh, second layer closer to axis in two-layer model, right? So I'll have, well, you will see, right? We'll run the model. Let's go. Let's run the model. And there it is. And if I want just a picture, right, there is nothing uh, really informative diagram right there. So this is how my model looks. Pretty complicated. So these are my eight uh, nodes in uh, hidden layer number one and four nodes in hidden layer number two. And by the uh, icon that you see in the node, we know that this is a sigmoid function, 10H, right? Okay, cool. So I'm going to do the same exact thing. Let me go ahead and save that. Um, publish, publish prediction formula, right? So publish prediction formula. And it's supposed to update my formula depot, right? So here's my formula depot and there it is, right? So now in Formula Depot, I have saved three different models. My tree, uh, logistic regression, and neural nets. And now uh, all I have to do really is co compare them, right? And see which ones perform the best. So as you probably guessed by now, it's all in the red triangle, right? Everything in jump is in red triangle. Okay, so do you see the part that says model comparison right there? And it says, which models do you want to compare? Well, all of them, right? So I'm going to hold down control and pick all three of my models. And when I click OK button, there it is, okay? At the end, it says predictors, yeah, okay. At the very end, here, here is my uh, main output, right? So uh, I have R squared, right? And then I have misclassification rate, so what am I looking for in terms of R squared, high or low? 
R squared should be high. Means classification rate, high or low? Low, right? So, uh, is logistic regression a good, a good fit? No, right? Because R squared is lowest, and the means classification rate, you can see, is highest, right? Means classifies about 14% of observations, right? Uh, how about neural net? R squared is, well, general, let's look at generalized, 0.5, right? Which is decent. Not crazy, great, but decent, right? And misclassification rate is, um, well, 9.5%, almost 10%, right? So, it works better. How about my classification fee, partition? 58, no, 67, right, if I look at generalized. 68 almost percent R squared, and my misclassification rate is only 5%. So, this model is almost three times better, not quite, but almost, right? Three times better in terms of misclassifications uh, compared to my worst model, logistic regression, right? So, naturally, after that, I can go ahead and say, well, that's the thing, right? Make sense? Any questions, ladies and gents? One more thing that I wanted to point out, okay? Let's say I'm working in the company, right? And I'm data analyst. And I'm doing that type of modeling, right? I get the data, I clean the data, then I run different models, compare them together, um, put together the presentations, recommendations, visualize the results, etc., etc., okay? Um, at the end of the day, when I present my results to my managerial supervisors, the managers, right? They'll look at that and say, yeah, I like what I see, so let's, let's go with this one, right? So you're saying that partition works the best to predict who will leave out of my customers. Um, but that, that model is using data that happened already, right? So these 3,300 records that I used, that's historical stuff, right? It's, the, it's in the past, right? We know that these people leave. The real value, how we can use this model, is predict who will leave in the future. We don't know it yet, but likely these people will leave. That's what the model says, right? So therefore, we can spot these people, customers who will leave, and do something about that, right? What can you do, by the way? Let's say you identify John Smith from, um, I don't know, Virginia Beach is the customer who will soon probably leave AT&T. What can AT&T management do about that? What, what's, what's some action, right? Uh-huh, Michael? Yeah, offer an incentive, right? Some money off. Or maybe a new um, cell phone, right? Uh, like Apple, it's called 10, right? Apple X, Apple 10. How much is Apple 10? iPhone 10. 1,000 bucks, right? Crazy. Who would, whoever thought that we're going to pay 1,000 bucks for a cell phone? So offer them uh, iPhone 10 for 500 bucks if they sign another two-year contract, right? Something like that. Um, so, but first we need to identify that this guy, John Smith from Virginia Beach, is likely to leave the company, right? So in other words, we have to have this model scoring customers in the real time, right? So we need to communicate with IT, so put, put that in work, so to speak, right? We need to communicate to the IT people, hey, this is the model that we built, okay? And you have control of all the code that runs behind the scenes, right, on the servers. So can you take my model and put it together with the database so that uh, every once in a while your, your code will pull records out of the database about all of these variables, right? Who is the customer? Where do they live? How many voice messages they have? Do they have an international plan or not? How many minutes they used? It's all recorded, right? They have records about all of that, okay? So the code pulls the data out of the database, runs the model, right? This data feeds, feeds the data through the model, and the model spits him out the answer, saying, yep, this customer with his data that we have currently, the likelihood to leave is 0.75, which means that, yeah, he's probably going to leave, right? We classify him as a risk customer, right? So therefore, that's the red flag, so you need to do something about that, right? Offer him incentive, right? Send them, send him a nice, you know, promotional offer in the mail, saying, "Yeah, if you act now, next two year contract, you'll get your iPhone 10 for 500 bucks." So basically, how do we implement this thing, right? 
how do I take that model? Because right now, as I'm looking at it, it's just basically output from, I don't know, from, from, from jump, right? It has to be a code. So here is the thing, right? Let's go to the one that I actually still have. It's model comparison. Here, neural network, right? Neural network, fine. Um, let's see if I can actually find that. Uh, no, not this one. Let's look at the formula depot. Neural net fit logistic regression. Yeah, right there, okay? So, in the formula depot, right? Uh, there is a red triangle. So, for example, let's say I want to publish, I want to create the model. Which one was my best model? This one, partition, right? Partition. <laughs> so, I want to give a code, right? A programmatic code to my IT department, telling them that, hey, I built a model, and that's the code for the model, right? I don't have to write the code, the program can do that for me. So, right there, okay, generate Python code. Have you heard about Python? I believe I mentioned Python, right? It's basically one of the most popular programming languages right now in the area of data analytics, okay? So, I don't have to write the code. I click the button and there it is. How do you like them apples? Doesn't make it much sense, does it? When you look at it, it's just a bunch of crap, right? But that's, that's basically programming code, okay? So every time, and uh, do you see all these conditions? If, if, else, else, uh, L, if, etc. That's essentially how uh, the program creates, well, you, you know how, how the uh, decision tree works, right? You split the data and first thing, for example, is do they have international plan? Or uh, what's the number of the, uh, what's it called, service calls, right, that they placed? If the number is more than 10, then go here. If the number is less than 10, then go here, right? So, therefore, there should be if conditions, right? If the number of calls greater than 10, next uh, if, right? If it splits further, then next, etc. That's why you see a lot of these if, else, if, else, right? It's basically navigating your pathway through the decision network, right? So, each branch, each, each final leaf of the, uh, of the decision tree is essentially a bunch of if conditions, right? If calls are greater than nine, and after that, if they have a voice plan, right? And if they have more than 29 messages, and if their day calls are greater than 20, 21, et cetera, right? Just a bunch of ifs, right? And then you arrive to a, to a destination, uh, and then at the end it says, yep, here is your probability, right there, okay, 0.85. So essentially that's code implementation of my tree, okay? So after that, what I can do is take this file, send it to my IT director and tell him, yep, here is the model that I've built. You can take it and use it, okay? All you have to do really is read a bunch of stuff from the database, throw that into the code, and code will spit out for you the answer. What's the likelihood of that specific customer to leave or to stay, okay? But that's another advantage of, of Jump, I guess, right? So uh, people, uh, there are other companies who are not using Jump, right? There are companies who are using Python to do data analytics. In this case, there is somebody employed inside the organization who writes that code, okay? Sort of, kind of, not really. I'm, I'm, I'm actually lying. There are packages, right? There are packages in Python that basically do that stuff for you, right? So all of that was already programmed. You just need to hire programmers who can put these things together, put the appropriate uh, programming library, write the code, and then build the model, and then use that, okay? So nobody really writes that code out. So there are libraries and packages that do that stuff, okay? But that's basically how easy it is to do data analytics. You just run the model and then code is there for you. And that's just Python, right? Uh, what if the organization is using something else? Well, here, right? You can spit out uh, C code. C, it's actually weird, quite honestly, just between us chickens again. Uh, C is old language, right? It, it's like 30, 40 years old. The more modern language is C++, which is very popular, okay? So why they generate C code, quite honestly, I don't know. And there is JavaScript. JavaScript is one of the popular languages these days as well, quite honestly, okay? So all these cool visual effects that you see on the pages where you point a mouse and then cool menu unfolds after that's all the visualization, that's JavaScript, okay? And then SAS. Uh, SAS is another uh, product from, well, Jump 
Jam belongs to SaaS Corporation, right? And they have another program uh, which is called SaaS Enterprise Data Miner, which is considered to be heavy artillery. So, uh, what I uh, like myself personally, I view SaaS as a heavy artillery. So it can do really complicated distributed databases, uh, you know, data pooling. So all kinds of really cool stuff. And Jump is a younger brother of, of SaaS Enterprise Data Miner. It's really supposed to be a single user program. So you buy it, you install it on the computer, you work with the data that's on your computer, and that, that's that's Jump. Okay, SaaS is more complicated. So essentially, you can you can create the code without writing a single line of single line of program. Okay, after you run the model, that's pretty cool too. All right, that's it. We're done pretty much for the semester. That's all I have to say about data analytics. All right. So what are we doing on Friday? Review. Review. Just between us, I don't know what that means. Uh, does it mean that in 50 minutes I'm supposed to cram the entire semester worth of stuff? Yes. You think that's possible, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's it for.